We are live now. Hello. Three, two, one. We are live now. Please start the session. Sir. Chaitanya, you are not audible. You will have to unmute yourself, Chaitanya. Hello. So unmute yeah. yourself. Support system, can you mute yourself? There is a lot of disturbance from your end. Still lots of, lot of uh, noise at the background. Good morning all. I, Dr. Chaitanya Ganpule, Clinical Secretary, uh, Pune Obstetrics and Gynec Society, would like to welcome you all on behalf of uh, Pune Obstetrics and Gynec Society for this webinar today. POGS Connect with Experts is a series which we started in the month of April and uh, we have been continuing with this series. Through this series, we have connected to a lot of different uh, stalwarts in the field of our obstetrics and gynecology as well as non-obstetrics and gynec uh, as well. Today, we are going to discuss about vaccination and fever in pregnancy. And we have stalwarts like Dr. Geeta Balsarkar, Dr. Deep Datta, Brigadier Dr. Aruna Menon and Professor Dr. Girija Vag with us today. To chair the session, today we have Dr. Harshad Parasnis, President, Pune Obstetrics and Gynec Society. A consultant gynecologic oncologist practicing in the, Pune of, in the city of Pune. He is the head of the Gynec Oncology Unit and Associate Professor at Bharati Medical College. He is a visiting gynecologic oncologist at BJ GMC and Sassoon General Hospital. He is also a consultant gynecologic oncologist at Ruby Hall Clinic, Vanauri. And he has been a chairperson of Oncology Committee, Foxy, for the year 2009-2011. And he is an uh, present chairperson of the Oncology Committee of AMOX. Welcome, Dr. Harshad. I also welcome Dr. Ashwini Kai to um, chair the session for today. She is an IVF consultant and the chief embryologist at Asha Kiran Hospital. She is the general secretary for POGS 2020-21. She is also chairperson of AMOX Young Talent Promotion Committee 2020-22. She is treasurer for Maharashtra chapter of ISA 2018-20, zonal coordinator for AMOX in the year 2016-18, and she is a peer reviewer of J J J Jogi 2016 and 18, and was an ex -assist assistant professor BJ Medical College Pune. I welcome both Dr. Harshad and Dr. Ashwini and um, ask them to chair the session and to take over from here. Over to you, Dr. Harshad. Thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, we bring in yet another uh, connect with we will just connect with experts uh, this time, and it is going to be on uh, vaccination and fever in pregnancy. We all know that vaccination against infectious diseases has literally transformed this planet. It has succeeded in elimination of smallpox and near elimination of polio as scourges of humankind. This kind of success, as well as the great increase, uh, great increase in the understanding of immunology and development of new technologies, has increased the hopes that new vaccines will target other diseases. Indeed, expectations have been raised so much that vaccines are now being developed not just to prevent infectious diseases, but to cure them also. Vaccinations, vaccines in pregnancy will also impact the, not only just the outcome of the pregnancy and the infant, but also the future generations to come. So today, we start off with our first topic about of vaccination in pregnancy. Before I start the session, let me thank GSK for the uh, academic uh, partnership in this program. And uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker on EDAP in pregnancy, Dr. Geeta Balsarkar, a good friend of ours. Uh, she's been the she's the professor and unit head at Naurushivadia Maternity Hospital and Say GS Medical College, Mumbai. She's also the joint clinical secretary of Mumbai OBGY Society. And we all know that she is the associate editor of Jogi, our journal. 
now we must congratulate her now this time because the journal is now uh, is going to become a e journal and um, therefore the reach is going to increase and all of us will be easily access these journals she is also the president of amwi mumbai branch and the vice president of the mumbai menopause society uh, mumbai chapter so i welcome geeta and uh, invite her to speak on um, tdap in pregnancy geeta the stage is all yours please unmute yourself can you see yes now we can yes. hear yeah okay can you see my slide yes okay i'm uh, going to the topic given to uh, thank you uh, dr harshad for that kind introduction actually uh, mumbai being closer to pune we are, i'm almost a uh, part of pogs because somehow i have got into the list of smss that uh, i receive i keep receiving from pogs about their programs hello Yes. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I didn't hear some. So I thought whether I'm audible or not. So I'm uh, very happy to tell you all that I'm taking over as the editor of the journal from January. So all those who are interested in academics are invited to be peer reviewers and to be not only read the journal but also be a very much a part of the journal. Now, the topic that is given to me today is a Tdap vaccination during pregnancy to prevent neonatal pertussis. when uh, dr ashwini kare asked me to speak about this i was uh, told that what will i speak for 20 minutes on tdap but uh, once uh, i agreed and i have gone through it i can really tell you that there is so much to know the advances are there which we have to know so uh, there are a lot of uh, miscommunications and misconceptions pertaining to immuniz immunization it has not changed over the years at all if we see in 1796 the english doctor edward jenner who created the history's first vaccine it involved fluid from the cowpox uh, the pustules of bovines we all know that and much much many hundred years later we are having the same kind of story making headlines that people are reluctant for vaccination and they are scared of vaccination so one such vaccine is tdap now if you see this particular chart we can see in the in the morbidity in the 20th century and morbidity in the 21st century we can see all the diseases smallpox diphtheria measles mumps pertussis so if we see to that we still have significant amount of morbidity and mortality from pertussis especially of the neonatal in the neonatal age group so when we talk about immunization you must know that you are defined as an immunity which is artificially induced and or provided this immunization can be active or passive the active immunization is to induce the body to produce lasting defense against the infection which is the vaccination we are going to talk to you today more and more about this active immunization which is the vaccination so a little little bit clear the concept in an in unimmunized person if there is a pathogen and you can see here that if this is the pathogen that is infecting him in the first week the first thing that is is a cellular response which comes and then the antibodies slowly rise so the patient starts getting immunity somewhere after one week the igm starts even much later more than about one week whereas when we see about an immunized person if the infection does occur it is almost eliminated in the first week and by the second week we have a very good amount of antibodies already in the body that is why immunization is very very important especially against the pertussis now there are various concerns about vaccine safety and a um, lot of uh, you know studies are also going on about that but tdap doesn't fall into this category and why pregnancy why 
we have to choose to immunize a mother in pregnancy but there is no direct evidence to risk to the fetus without any vaccine and but most live people fear that whether the live vaccine will cause viremia and whether the patient herself will get infected during the pregnancy but we have to remember that maternal immunization is for the benefit of the newborn since the newborn cannot be immediately immunized at birth with pertussis vaccine we have to immunize the mother especially in the late second or the third trimester so that the newborn is protected in the first six months of life and this pregnancy is a very unique time where pregnant women are motivated to improve their health for their sake as well as for the baby's sake but when you tell them that this is for the betterment of the baby the patients definitely are very receptive but it all depends on the provider input whether the provider themselves are motivated to produce such vaccination so when i'm going to talk today i'm going to talk to you in this flow where it is a neonatal pertussis burden the need an ideal time for maternal immunization what is the formulation of the boostrix the safety immunogenicity and the vaccine effectiveness data and the recommendations along with the summary so when we talk about neonatal pertussis burden pertussis is more commonly known as a whooping cough it is a highly communicable respiratory infection caused by bordetella pertussis and the transmission is airborne droplets or direct contact with nasopharyngeal discharges hopefully because of the masks we wear during the covid times the other respiratory infections will come down hence during this particular covid era we will probably see less of the pertussis infection but how contagious it is it it, um, it is sorry i have hello hello madam yeah can you hear me Yes, sir. yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how contagious is pertussis? If we try to see that. Uh, if we can see that the basic reproduction number for the pertussis are similar to those of measles and but they are higher than that of influenza mumps polio rubella or smallpox so it is as much the infection or the contagiousness is as much that of the measles so what are the challenges in estimating the neonatal pertussis uh, burden there is a systematic review in feb 2019 which says that there is varied clinical case definition across the age group what is more important is the clinical presentation in the young infant is very non specific and there is lack of established pertussis surveillance system in india and also lack of rt pcr robust techniques therefore diagnosis itself can become a problem the clinical presentation is very non specific and different people can have different types of presentation so even if the mother has pertussis we may not be able to diagnose it and she can transmit it to the infant so what is the risk of pertussis to the young infants more than 90% of infants under 2 months of age with pertussis they require hospitalization so these infants newborn children are often requiring hospitalization more than 75% of pertussis related death occur in infants under 2 months of age so the complications are mostly pneumonia seizures or even encephalopathy sometimes they can manifest like this and what is the need and the ideal time of vaccination we all are giving the tetanus vaccine to the mother so the last one can be you know replaced by dt dtap dtap vaccine so if you want to give primary immunization at birth for the baby we have to give at 6 weeks 10 weeks 14 weeks then there is a booster there are two boosters one at one and half years and one between 4 to 6 years this is for the infant once the baby is born we have to give the primary immunization for the baby it begins only at 6 weeks so what about the time from birth to 6 weeks this period is particularly not covered so the first dose of dtp vaccine is not recommended until 6 6 to 8 weeks of age why because even if we vaccinate the baby before that they do not develop a good immunity so we have to wait for the maturation of the immune system till they can you know develop proper immunity so the Six weeks after birth are virtually not covered by the uh, vaccine. So we have to provide some other. There is an immunity gap. So infants are not protected from six weeks to two months of life. So the older individuals they have the reservoir of infection and they potentially transmit the disease to unvaccinated or the partially vaccinated infants. It could be the uh, you know children could have vac vaccine induced protection, but as they become adolescent and the adults and elderly, their immunity starts reducing and there could be effectively very limited immunity. from the adults and elderly and they can transmit it to the newborn 
infants. So which family members often give um, the infants the infection? It could mostly in 30, more than 32% of the cases, it is a mother. And it could also be the father. The parents put together form almost 50% where the baby gets the infection from. It could be the other sibling, the grandparents or the other children from the neighbors or the other family members. So we have to remember that most of the kids get the uh, Hortus's infection from the parents themselves. Now, if we see to it, this study shows 37% from the mother, 17% from the father, somewhere, you know, even more than 50%, they are getting infections from the parents only. So mother and father are the main source of infant pertussis, uh, uh, you know, for, for transmission. So we, what vaccination strategy is most effective in protecting young infants from pertussis? Of course, we have to bolster the adolescent and the adult vaccination. Then is cocooning and maternal immunization has found to be highly effective in protecting the infants from pertussis. We as obstetricians come here. We are highly, if we, if we just motivate the mother to take proper pertussis vaccination, the infant can be protected up to six weeks to two months of age. Why vaccination during pregnancy can help protect infants? Because the ob objective of vaccination uh, during pregnancy is to boost the maternal antibodies. These maternal antibodies are actively transported across the placenta, which provide passive immunity to the neonate before he or she can be vaccinated. So the placental transfer of antibodies as per gestational age. So why we decided to give in the third trimester and not early. So if the patient is given when first pregnant, the fetal IgG is not formed, it starts to increase by 13 weeks at 5 to 10 percent of maternal levels at about uh, later. So if we see that in the third trimester, the immunity that is achieved by the mother, the IgG antibodies are maximum and they can be transmitted to the fetus. This is a little bit about the boosteric formulation that is the diphtheria, tetanus and the other uh, uh, diseases it covers. It can be considered during the third trimester of pregnancy. It has shown no vaccine related adverse effect on pregnancy or on the health of the fetus or the newborn in the second and the third trimester. So what is the safety immunogenicity? What are the evidence on safety profile? In a study in the US, they said that Tdap vaccine more than once they have given in consecutive pregnancy in the past five years. Antipartum Tdap vaccination does not lead to pregnancy related morbidity, even with repetitive do dosing in serial pregnancy. Then Tdap vaccine have demonstrated a suitable safety profile and use of Tdap was not in, uh, associated with an increase in the rate of primary outcomes. So there are lots of data on the safety and immunogenicity. So they have assessed whether uh, the boosterics, they elicit superior level of pertussis antibodies in cord blood. Yes, they have been found to, in, uh, you know, have a lot of cord, uh, cord blood immunity, especially in the patients who have been vaccinated. The mothers who have been vaccinated, they have found to have a lot of antibodies in the cord blood. Now, vaccinated women show increased GMCs for antigen. So one month post vaccination, that is tentatively like around the delivery time, mothers given boosterics in the third trimester, they show a lot of increased um, antigen and even the conversion to the antibody. So the vaccination during pregnancy results in higher level of pertussis antibodies in the cord blood, which can protect the baby up to six weeks of age. So similar frequency was reported in the pregnancy and the neonatal AESIs in boosterix and control group. There has been no change in the IUGR, preeclampsia, pregnancy related hypertension, premature labor, premature rupture of membranes, preterm birth, vaginal hemorrhage, small for gestational age. So all these are same in the vaccinated as well as in the non-vaccinated group. So it does not adversely affect the pregnancy. Now, vaccinated women had more than nine times higher antibody levels against this apoptosis antigen. And the cord blood of infants born to vaccinated women are, had higher, nine times higher antibody levels of pertussis antibodies compared to the control group. Also, there was no increased risk of adverse outcomes for either the mother or the infants, which are consistent with the well-established safety profile of boosterix in the general population. Therefore, it is very, very safe and it shows efficient transplacental transfer of the pertussis antibodies to the infant after vaccination. 
there are a lot of studies which have been shown that in uk in spain in australia from 2014 16 and all where the mother has been vaccinated as early between 27 weeks to 36 weeks it has been found it is even if they are vaccinated at 28 weeks they have very good antibody levels at 36 weeks or at around delivery and the infants and the neonates are protected against the pertussis disease so what are the national recommendations in the us acog in 2011 has said administer tdap vaccine to all pregnant women as early as 28 7 to 28 weeks and up to 36 weeks you can give them the who in 2015 said vaccination of pregnant women is likely to be one of the most cost effective strategy for preventing disease in infants who are actually too young to be vaccinated and the rcog in 2016 has said that women are recommended to receive a dose of tdap during each pregnancy which should be administered from 16 to 32 weeks in uk they give it as early as 16 weeks up to 32 weeks regardless of previous receipt of tdap every time a patient gets tdap her antibodies go higher and higher in foxy in india to in 2016 has recommended that tdap should be administered during pregnancy in order to provide optimal protection to the baby during the first two months of life and the strength of recommendation is a grade a so there is a good recommendation foxy itself has recommended from 2016 and indian association of pediatricians has also recommended in 2016 that at least one dose of tdap to pregnant mothers as well as the adolescents who visit you during each pregnancy and it is preferred from 27 to 36 weeks of gestation regardless of the number of years from prior vaccination if the mother says that i have also been vaccinated against uh, you know the pertussis in at my birth or even the adolescent has been vaccinated it does good to give them an additional dose of tdap vaccine so there are a lot of countries all the countries around the world you can see they are recommending tdap vaccination from canada to us to mexico to chile argentina netherlands uk switzerland greece israel and only the country with blue is india the rest of the all all over the world they are offering tdap to the mothers so what are the major factors that influence the maternal immunization first and foremost even among doctors there is a safety concern is it really safe and concerns about efficacy or necessity is it really necessary or will it actually work so these are the main concerns of the doctors lack of knowledge about the target disease because we are trying to target something in the neonates the pertussis is a problem which the obstetricians don't normally see it is seen by the pediatricians so they feel okay wo log dekh lenge whatever is a problem they will see why should we give an extra vaccine and suppose there is some problem then they get very worried and therefore this is one of the main barriers of using tdap no recommendation by the healthcare workers and the lack of access to the vaccine services no the uh, storage and all is a big problem where the, in in the in the you know peripheral centers therefore they say okay we can avoid this particular vaccination but it is the gyne obstetricians recommendation that matter most when recommendation of vaccination during pregnancy come directly from the obstetric care provider they have found that the odds of vaccination are 5 to 50 fold higher so let us offer tdap vaccination as per foxy recommendation of 2016 to all our pregnant patients who present to us if you see the cost and the vaccination cost of vaccination versus the benefit ratio the benefits way out way the cost much much higher so to summarize the burden of pertussis in neonates is significantly under recognized especially by the obstetricians boostrick offers three in one protection against diphtheria tetanus and pertussis Foxy GCPR 2016 has said Tdap should be administered during pregnancy in order to provide optimal protection to the baby during the first months of life. Global and local bodies, including RCOG and ACOG, strongly recommend Tdap vaccination during pregnancy. OBGYN recommendations are the most influencing factor for vaccination against pertussis. So. what we you know most of us are very uh, worried about the adverse effects in adults and pregnancy the common uh, very common adverse effects are injection site redness swelling malaise fatigue 
fever and the uncommon ones are upper respiratory diarrhea vomiting lymphadenopathy rash and if we see the adverse effects during pregnancy it is mainly the pain the inject injection site induration and headache nausea vomiting fever myalgia arthralgia which has been reported so thank you very much for giving me a chance to present this particular presentation and i strongly feel that we as obstetricians we should be able to offer tdap to all our pregnant women and ensure that we don't lose any neonat up to 2 months of life because of pertussis it is on us it is upon us to see that there is no neonatal death due to pertussis up to 2 months of age thank you thank you thank you geeta a very very a good presentation actually a uh, points very well driven home that uh, how the importance of this vaccine um, i think before we go on uh, further can we have question and answers now itself chaitanya yeah i'm okay or yes sir we can can i say something harshad can i say something yep yes girija yeah Uh, Gita, that was a wonderful presentation, and I must put it here on record that in 2014, Foxy made its uh, vaccination recommendation where it very vociferously talked about influenza and the Tdap vaccination. And what is very important is that it gets administered definitely by 26 weeks because the immune globulin formation, the antibody formation uh, capabilities of the pregnant mother are much more profound during that period of time. and we must offer an advantage of even prevention of diphtheria which is again come back in a big you know big bang kind of a thing so thank you geeta for again reiterating and coming up with the level of recommendations which the foxy has mentioned and reiterated in 2016 and i think this is very important that we opt it in our at least in our private practices we can definitely offer it to our patients if it's not possible in the public sector thank you no no i'm sure it is possible in the public sector it only needs a will it only needs yeah. a government will and it needs a will for the obstetrician we don't see a, a, the, what, what happens to the babies up to 2 months of age once they are born they don't come back to us that is one of the main reasons so we as obstetricians we have to cover even you know we have to think little bit beyond our delivery and we have to think little bit beyond and it's a small price that they are going to pay for a very big thing what if the neonat gets admitted to the nicu how much are the parents going to spend yeah we have to Absolutely. consider vaccination we have to consider vaccination yeah now um there are geeta there are few questions um a basic question There are few questions that have come up. How long does the immunity, the protection, last? It is, it is supposed to last a lifetime. But the amount of immunity that the mother needs to transmit to the baby, for that we need to give another fresh antigen stimulation. Okay. There is one more question. Booster dose, is it needed? And if yes, when to be given? Uh, see if, if if the mother has received a pertussis vaccine once at when she was born this what we are giving during pregnancy it's itself a booster dose every pregnancy they have to receive an additional booster dose so that an large amount of antibodies are produced which can be actively transported across the placenta okay whether fever is a side effect or a reaction it's not a reaction it is a very common side effect okay there is one more question but i think that question uh, i i would prefer dr datta to take because it's is it true that influenza virus h1n1 change its strain every year yes it's true that question because he is going to yeah true to true but it is true but not so with pertussis so we can we uh, we have to safely vaccinate between 28 mm -hmm. weeks to 36 weeks and we have to give time for mm -hmm. the antibodies to increase the mother to respond with igg antibodies itself takes time and the amount of antibodies required for active transport across the placenta is also larger that is why it is safer to vaccinate them you know somewhere between 30 to 32 weeks so that there is enough time for the transfer of the antibodies to the baby okay thank you madam what do you thank sir you. we have done with the questions 
yeah uh, thanks geeta i think uh, point well driven home uh, we must start t rap instead of injection tetanus toxoid that is even that question was also there why why t rap instead of tetanus toxoid no, that was also a question which was there but i you already answered that we are anyway giving tetanus toxoid so one injection in place of the other and you are covering more diseases and this is required for the amount of uh, an antibody you know the surge in the antibody or the amount of antibody is required for greater protection like if we if if we give only tt the baby will be protected against only tt but if we give tdap the baby is protected against more diseases yeah one more question that has come up here is that uh, like in tetanus toxoid who's recommendation is that in the first pregnancy uh, maybe if you are giving two doses in the subsequent pregnancies you can also uh, make do with one because you already she is fully immunized mm -hmm. Similarly, here in the in the previous pregnancies, if you already given her T dab in the subsequent pregnancy, would you still want to give her T dab? Yes, every pregnancy they have to be given T dab. The idea of giving T dab is that with every subsequent vaccination, you need a large amount of antibody IgG antibodies to be produced, which can be transferred to the baby. If you don't give in a pregnancy, like if she has received in pre-event pregnancy, and now you don't give, the infant will be immunized against pertussis, but not for six to eight weeks that we need. They will be for some days, and then they may be not, you know, having so many antibodies that they need for a longer time of immunization. Therefore, we have to immunize this. patients fresh every pregnancy yeah so i think a, a good take home message every pregnancy needs to be vaccinated with tdap vaccine instead of uh, injection tetanus toxoid uh, should we say it between 16 to 28 or you want 32 no no coxie recommends 20 7 to 36 weeks okay 27 to 36 weeks is what foxy recommends and beyond 36 weeks if you give the baby will not get igg because it takes time for the formation of igg and a large amount and to get enough amount to be transmitted to the baby to last for 6 weeks it is not possible therefore we have to give it little early yeah in case you give a patient uh, tdap and she has a preterm delivery then also so will it be effective in that case whatever amount of antibody she has developed it depends on her primary immunization and how much she responds to this particular thing but tdap is not responsible for prematurity that is why they say you should give it at 27 weeks so even if she has prematurity you have covered her adequately okay okay yeah. madam a question uh, if it's going to take time for the antibodies to develop and the quantity of antibodies which is going to go to the baby is going to uh, affect the immunity of the baby why not to give this vaccine even before she is uh you know getting pregnancy so in the pre pregnancy counseling why not to give it no then the uh, the like girija wag said at around 27 to 28 weeks a mother's immune system has to produce so much igg that it has to be transmitted to the placenta if you give it in the pre pregnancy level you still have to give another dose during the pregnancy for the baby to get adequate protection till 6 weeks of age otherwise the baby will not have protection till 6 weeks of age the baby will be protected towards pertussis and how is the baby being pr protected by, by by the passive immunization no the baby does not produce any antibodies so it has to have that much antibodies that covers it for the six, full 6 to 8 weeks therefore you have to immunize at between 27 to 36 weeks again even if you give the mother that's why they say immunize the adolescent but also immunize the pregnant mother okay Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. Uh, very informative talk, and I think something that all of us must follow. Um, so let us move on to the. Thank you. Thank you, Arshad. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we we move on to the next uh, speaker in the next talk, which is on flu vaccine in pregnancy. And to talk about this, we have none other than Dr. Deep Datta, that you know, Dipendu Datta. actually very uh, very fondly called as deep datta he is uh, alumni of um, done an mbbs from calcutta medical college and then he did his md as from dj medical college and uh, amdabad he is now uh, a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at the, uh, the royal tunbridge wells hospital in england and uh, he is the council member of the board of trustees of rcog from 2012 to 2016 uh, he was instrumental in developing the obstetric simulation and the enhanced recovery in gynecology 
Uh, this was also between 2010 and 2014, and he has uh, been a very frequently uh, called um, uh, speaker at national international conferences. Even in uh, in India, we have been calling him quite frequently. We've been seeing him frequently in all of our conferences, and so it's my pleasure to have. Dr. Deep Datta speaking on uh, flu vaccine in pregnancy. Dr. Deep, the stage is all yours. Can you unmute yourself so that you can, you could be heard? Thank you so much, Dr. Parnas, for your very lovely uh, and warm introduction. I'm very uh, thrilled to be with you. Um, and I'm just going to try and share my screen. I had sent my slide deck. Yeah. Is it possible to share that from your end? Amir, can you just start the sharing? Open your presentation. Presentation. Open your presentation. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, then click on um, Zoom app. No, no. You have you have yourself. You uh, you have it with you, no, Mandar? No, no, no. Uh, one minute. Then I will do it from my. That's fine. You want? Okay. I'll have to. Mandar, you need to make Harchat sir host. Just a minute. Yeah. You can share your screen, sir. Yeah, one minute. Okay, um, is that my slide deck? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's cool. Thank you for that introduction. That's very kind. I'm just going to move on. Um, so we're going to talk about influenza in pregnancy and its prevention. It was very uh, useful to hear the previous speaker talk about the Tdap uh, in in uh, in India and the Foxy recommendations. In um, UK, uh, we do not do the Tdap, they do the pertussis vaccine, the whooping cough vaccine only. So uh, there are differences in practice, obviously, across uh, different countries and continents. So we're going to talk about influenza in pregnancy and its prevention. I'm going to try and cover uh, the practices in India and also uh, abroad. So uh, these are the four sections, how we will go through the talk. Introduction to what influenza is what the risk in pregnancy is, uh, the prevention methods that are being employed to try and minimize the risk of influenza in the mother and the newborn baby, and the Fluorex Tetra, which is a quadrivalent vaccine uh, that is developed by GSK. So, um, right, I'm going to give you a brief history of uh, how the influenza virus was isolated first in 1933, the second strain in 1940, influenza B, um, separate from influenza A. And then they found the antigenic drift of surface proteins. Um, they identified the H2N2 in 58 and 68, a decade apart, respectively. And then the B and the Victoria dominant B strain and the Yamagata strains were developed in the 80s and 90s, were discovered in the 80s and 90s. Um, so it has been quite a journey. So influenza A uh, is subclassed uh, or subtype based on the uh, hemagglutinin and the neuronamidase surface proteins. The main circulating strains are H1N1 and H3N2. The influenza B has got lineage of Victoria and Yamagata. Influenza C is rarely reported in humans, but we also see it sometimes. So. Looking at the hemagglutinin A, um, uh, hemagglutinin, so that is uh, the one of the uh, structures and the neuraminidase is one of the structures. So we take the H and the N of each of these and then designate the um, virus subtype. So if you look at how the virus is classed, the antigenic virus type is taken first and then the geographic origin, the stream number, the year of isolation, virus subtype. And that is the center of disease control in the USA, how they name the, the, um, the virus uh, or strain for that season. So it's quite a lot of work that goes on continuously uh, and across many centers around the globe. 
So the antigenic varies, variation in the virus leads to epidemic and pandemic. And as you know, the epidemic is limited to um, spread within a geographic community, locality, or region. Pandemic, as you know, is uh, something that affects different continents and many, many countries. So the antigenic drift uh, arises from mutations in the HA and NA of the same virus. It is frequent in both A and B, and it's limited to certain population groups in one country uh, or maybe a subcontinent. Uh, but the antigenic shift actually has got a potential of causing a pandemic. The difference is clear. So the virus strain um, gets into an altered RNA mutation of an infected cell and the virus with the antigenic drift, this is the section on the left of your page, um, avoids the host antibodies, where the virus with no antigenic drift will be recognizable by the host antibodies. So there's a difference if the virus takes on the mRNA of the uh, host cell. The, in direct contrast, you've got the antigenic shift uh, from the drift where the two virus strains enter an infected cell and then new virus is formed and then this occurs in type A influenza only. Now this is a potential to cause a pandemic strain. And this is what we are seeing with the coronavirus currently where the infected cell uh, emerges with a new virus that's completely different in genetic make makeup to the two virus strains that had infected the cell in the first place. Okay, so, so pandemics there are four pandemics that have happened so far, the H1N1 in 18 to 20, the Spanish flu, and then you have the H2N2, the Asian flu, uh, sometime in the 50s, and the H3N2 in the Hong Kong flu in the late 60s, and then H1N1, the swine flu, that is in recent memory uh, in 2009, 2010, the current pandemic, of course. So seasonal variation in global influenza, influ incidence of influenza, as you look uh, on the right hand side of your page, you will see that in the northern regions um, during November and March, that is the winter months for us, especially in, the, in, in India and the UK, where in the southern regions, mostly in Australia, New Zealand uh, and uh, South America, you have southern May to September uh, and in temperate regions in winter. So in tropical regions is throughout the year. So a lot of uh, parts of India, say central India, eastern, southern India, uh, you will have uh, the, uh, the incidence of influenza almost throughout the year on different strains. Okay, transmission is by droplets, aerosol, and through direct contract with respiratory secretions, spreads rapidly in closed communities, especially in day centers, schools, uh, and closed office spaces, in shawls, slums, and so on. Uh, children can transmit flu to others for 10 days or more. So the complications are secondary bacterial pneumonia, which is what we worry about in pregnant women because their he blood hemodynamics is changed. The blood volume increases by about 50%. Uh, the red cells increase by about 40%. So uh, the lung perfusion increase, the lung capacity is reduced because the diaphragmatic shift upwards. So the risk of bacterial pneumonia uh, in, in compromised pregnant women, especially in late pregnancy, is a reason for worry. The other are central nervous system uh, manifestations like meningitis, encephalitis, and meningoencephalitis. And there are some other uh, complications like myocarditis, pericarditis, and sepsis. So these are the reasons why we have to be alert with pregnant women and prevent uh, influenza. So the vaccine development from surveillance to vaccination, there is a global influenza surveillance and response system. There are 141 institutions in 111 member countries, including India, six collaborating centers, and four essential regulatory uh, labs. So the WHO identifies the yearly antigenic variants, recommends the vaccine composition for the next six months, and the vaccine manufacturers begin production given the virus seed that is distributed to the manufacturers and this process takes about six months. In the Northern Hemisphere, like we said, uh, gen vaccine generally begins in September. In the South, probably around April time. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to maintain these timelines because of delay in production, but we try to do that every year for pregnant women across the globe. So the differences between common cold influenza and COVID-19, and this is an important slide because it gives you a 
one short summary of how uh, influenza is different from cold and how COVID-19 is different from influenza. So in, fever, for example, will be high with chills in COVID, but high in influenza, no chills. Headache is very common in both influenza and COVID, but in cold, you don't have that. Nasal breathing problems, shortness of breath is one of the chief markers in COVID. Oxygen saturations drop very quickly, but influenza and cold both have stuffy, runny noses. And sneezing is uncommon in COVID. Sneezing is very common in the common cold, but very, um, very uncommon in COVID and sometimes happens in influenza. Cough is severe in both influenza and COVID. And aches and pains, again, very severe in influenza and COVID. And fatigue can last for weeks in influenza and COVID, but not in the common cold. Sore throat is uncommon in COVID. And so sore throat is common in, in cold. And extreme exhaustion result, resulting from severe aches and pains is again common in both influenza and COVID. So as you can see, uh, multi-system involvement is common in influenza and COVID. So it's very difficult to tease out the differences between influenza and COVID. And, and so that is why it, uh, it is very possible that anyone presenting with symptoms of influenza will get COVID swab nowadays uh, because of the similarity of the symptoms. Okay. Just moving on to the next slide, so risk of influenza in pregnancy, which is the next um, slide. So in maternal risks of influenza, you've got two, twice the risk of maternal hospitalization. There's a four times chance of mortality, hospitalization in, in pregnant women with asthma. So people who've already got compromised bleeding problems like cystic fibrosis, asthma, uh, and pre-existing uh, chest and lung conditions will require more uh, ICU care and more intensive care and risk of multi-organ failure because of failure of oxygenation. For the baby, uh, you have low birth weight and fetal death and preterm birth. Fetal, fetal death and preterm birth is multiplied four times and that is quite a worrying feature. Major cause of hospitalization. So thank you for that. So now moving on to the next one about the literature review of eight studies. This was undertaken about a decade ago, so it's old data, looking at Southwest and North India for 12,000 women. And they found that the maternal mortality or losing women from respiratory complications brought about by influenza and multi-organ dysfunction, besides fetal loss and premature delivery, also cost the healthcare system uh, a lot of money in terms of um, fiscal deficit. ICU admissions, prolonged hospitalization in, in increases the utilization of beds, minimizing the, the bed usage for other conditions. And uh, like I said, multiple uh, organ failure is common. So that's why we need to prevent the influenza uh, and, and the need for vaccination for pregnant mothers across the globe. So why is that? What are the benefits to the mother? The benefits of the mother are a robust immune response, prevents the complications, decreases need for hospitalization, more time in the community and her other existing children and adverse pregnancy and perinatal outcomes. For the newborn, you prevent low birth weight and preterm babies. Again, you reduce hospitalization for such babies, transplacental transfer of antibodies to fetus, and it fills the gap till the infant immunization can begin. So quite a lot of advantage for both mother and baby. So types of influenza vaccine are trivalent and quadrivalent. The important difference, as you can see, both have got the influenza A, H1N1 and H3N2, where the trivalent vaccine has only Victoria or Yamagata, but not both. The quadrivalent vaccine has got both Victoria and Yamagata strains. So the quadrivalent vaccine is more equipped to deal with all strains of influenza in, in seasons. So the influenza B mismatch, often we find the mismatch occurs when the circulating lineage does not match the vaccine lineage. Now remember, we are always chasing our tail. We are actually six months behind on what the seasonal influence is. So if WHO and its regional centers bring out um, the um, trivalent vaccine with either Yamagata or Victoria, it could have, it could be possible that the circulating strain for that season is, is Yamagata. On the uh, other hand, the vaccine is equipped with only Victoria. And that is why 
with with studies with meta analysis of 34 random control trials on your right hand side of the page or the or you have seen 1500 subjects um, so mismatched lineage actually reduces the vaccine eff efficacy from 52% uh, to 27% as low as 22% um, and the trivalent uh, vaccine efficacy uh, with 95% uh, confidence intervals. So this cannot be predicted. That's our problem. We cannot predict what the influenza B lineage in circulation will be for a particular season uh, because we are always a bit behind in trying to predict what the um, strain will be. The global lab influence, this is, a, this is just a snapshot to actually tell you the co-circulation of both lineages have been reported in global surveillance as, I, as you can see um, for the B lineage that is not determined uh, is in significant proportion across uh, 2020 uh, all the weeks um, in the number of, of specimens that were tested and the, in, there is variation also in the A subtypes. Uh, especially the HN1 um, vaccine. So uh, this just shows you that there, there are different lineages in different um, specimens across the globe. Okay, so a multi-site surveillance was done more than a decade ago. Uh, they looked at quite a few centers uh, and samples were collected and as you can see of of all these cases, 27.8% were influenza A or H1N1, 29. nearly 30% were type A again H3N2, but 42% were type B, especially in major centers like, like Calcutta. So uh, the irrespective of geography, core circulation of both lineages of influenza B virus have been isolated for patients, which is why we think it's more important that we look at the quadrivalent vaccine rather than the trivalent vaccine because it covers both the Victoria and Yamagata strains of the B seasonal influenza. Again, the burden of influenza, as you can see, uh, is reported in, in different um, cities across um, three different years. And if I just highlight to you the uh, variation, you'll be able to see uh, the influenza virus types and subtype distribution differ significantly across cities. So if you compare, for example, uh, Srinagar and, and Kolkata um, or Srinagar and Velour, then you can find even in Calcutta between the three years you find that the influenza V B in 2012 accounted for over 97 percent and it significantly differs not only between cities but also between years in the same city uh, and that is what makes it very difficult to predict. Thank you. So the next slide tells you about the circulation of influenza B. It is unpredictable uh, and the disease burden is significant uh, and to protect against influenza B, both strains have to be uh, present rather than in the trivalent vaccine whether, where only one is present. So now for the recommendations. The global recommendations first came in 2012 that pregnant women should be vaccinated with influenza vaccine at any stage in pregnancy. Seasonal influenza vaccine is safe throughout pregnancy and effective in preventing influenza in women as well as young infants. Now this was nearly eight years ago and the ACOG, the American College of ONG in 2019 ratified this that all women who are pregnant or postpartum also should receive an influenza vaccination and in contrast to the Tdap where like you heard um, which should be given between 27 and 36 weeks. Uh, this can be given anytime during pregnancy. And this is obviously just to uh, recommend uh, it is an inactivated influenza vaccine that you're going to use. Okay. The FOX in 2018 reiterated the earlier decisions of both ACOG and WHO uh, to all pregnant women from 26 weeks onwards. Uh, strength of recommendation, quality of evidence is three. In case of a pandemic, the influenza vaccine can be given earlier to protect the mother. So this is something that we are doing recently in face of the COVID. But the Indian Association of Pediatrics in 2018, again, uh, in, from the point of view of infants, said that women who are immunized against influenza at any time during the pregnancy can provide protection for infants for the first six months of life till the baby is ready for the um, vaccination. 
So no safety concerns. A lot of anti-vaccine people in the USA and Western Europe, sometimes in India, are now raising a voice about um, you know, not using vaccinations, especially the MMR and so on. So the no safety concerns have been found in Europe and more than uh, one lakh pregnant women in Canada. So the pregnant population can be reassured that there is no side effect or concerns, safety concerns, and no increased risk of untoward maternal or fetal outcomes have been reported. The WHO Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety has enough robust safety profile of multiple inactivated influenza vaccines over many, many years. So the guidance on uh, maternal immunization in COVID times. Now, this is uh, slightly important now um, because the ACOG has now come out with a scientific impact paper which says maternal immunizations can continue to be an essential part and clinicians are in, encouraged to include the recommended maternal immunizations, the influenza and the Tdap. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the USA, um, they are saying that they are, women are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 compared to if there they wasn't COVID-19. So the course of COVID-19 and severity of COVID-19 is likely to be more uh, if a woman has both influenza and COVID. Uh, so it's probably better to uh, protect the woman against something that we already know uh, and, and hope that the COVID course is less severe in the woman who's, who's hit by both COVID and influenza and receiving the vaccines during pregnancy. So the Fluorix Tetra is something that has been uh, developed by GSK. It's a quadrivalent vaccine, and you've heard the advantages of quadrivalent over the trivalent. It's got a pre-filled serine dose um, containing one dose of 0.5 mils of the drug. So quadrivalent vaccine, influenza second, influenza B virus, in addition to the virus and trivalent vaccine, and the WHO, the Department of Health in the UK has also recommended that, and the Joint Com Committee on Vaccination, um, JCVI, has also suggested uh, that anyone in 18 to 65 age groups be given in the flu season. This was last year, but it's still continuing this year. Okay, so the reasons for selecting QIV um, or quadrivalent inact in inactivated vaccine is this. It's recommended in 18 under 65 at risk. It covers two main B lineages. Um, and the trivalent inactivated vaccine has higher immunogenicity and effectiveness in the elderly. So, so in the elderly, and I'm coming to that in the next slide, in the elderly, you stick to the trivalent vaccine. So the, the first uh, inactivated quadrivalent influenza vaccine um, for sale in the in the Indian um, uh, subcontinent is the one that's providing broader protection than the trivalent one. And to recap, it's got both the A uh, subtypes, H1N1 and H3N2, besides the Victoria and Yamagata strains of the B. And the quality tests for each batch are manufactured in Germany and 18 million doses sold across many countries. 24,000 subjects have been studied across countries, including India. So the data actually is sent by the Serum um, uh, Virological Institute in Pune to uh, WHO and CDC. The inactivated influenza vaccines can be used in all stages of pregnancy and postpartum. And this is for women who might have missed it in pregnancy, especially in semi-urban, semi-rural and rural areas. Uh, you might have a woman who has missed the, the vaccination. So if there's a chance to give it postpartum, please do so. The baby should be cared separately, of course. There are larger data sets on safety available in the safe second and third trimester. Like you heard in, in India, the recommendation is from 26 onwards and can be administered along with a Tdap uh, and can be used during breastfeeding and the postpartum period. So if there is an opportunity for post-delivery uh, follow-up, then please do that. Um, a single 0.5 mil dose, I've already said that, intramuscular injection, deltoid or the anterolateral thigh is an inactivated uh, influenza vaccine, can be co-administered with Tdap. So you minimize the visits for the woman. You don't, don't uh, do it in different times of the pregnancy. Um, so in summary, pregnant women and newborns are at high risk for complications due to influenza. 
health authorities across the globe from CDC to WHO to the um, UK regulatory agency and in India, the FOXI and the Indian Association of Pediatricians also recommend influenza vaccines are well tolerated with no side effects and the Fluorix tetra is the world's first inactivated quadrivalent vaccine has been widely tested and reported with regards to efficacy side effects. So summary from clinical trials, uh, as you can see, injection site pain is very common in all age groups and in uh, women and people over 18 years, fatigue and headache uh, account for uh, some symptoms and myalgia. But in younger people, uh, you have more drowsiness, irritability and loss of appetite. Uh, rare events, um, influenza-like illness, urticaria pruritis, allergic reactions, or Guillain-Barre syndrome or neuritis and lymphadenopathy are very, very um, uncommon. They have been reported uh, and there have been a cluster of cases in Singapore in 2017 uh, of neuritis, but they are very few and far between. Okay. And uh, that's all I have to say about the um, vaccine. There are other slides I'm not going to use because I just want to leave some time for any questions and discussion on the influenza vaccine. I think we can take any. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Deep. Uh, very comprehensive, informative lecture, and uh, uh, I think a lot needs to be discussed. Uh, Chaitanya, any questions? Yes. Uh, Professor, there are a few questions which I would like to ask uh, on behalf of the um, delegates. Is influenza vaccine safe in asthmatic pregnant uh, women? More so, more so, because I think it is more indicated in them because they are the ones who are likely to suffer from um, uh, you know, pulmonary complications and compromise should they get the influenza. So the safety efficacy in uh, asthma and also other conditions affecting the lungs has been well proven. Okay. Another question was that is, uh, is it necessary to take the vaccine every year and as per the changes in the strains given by the WHO, but that I think you have already answered that question. Yeah. So uh, in, in UK and US, for example, doctors have to have the vaccine. They cannot practice if they don't have the vaccine, the quadrivalent vaccine. In India, I was talking to my school groups uh, from my school and uh, medical college. It's not common practice for uh, adults to have the vaccine every year, but it is a good practice, whether pregnancy or not, to have the uh, vaccination every year uh, because the consequences of not having it even aside from pregnant women, is that it can cost a lot to the health economy. So uh, I'm not sure. Maybe at some point in time, India will consider universal influenza vaccination for all age groups. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the trivalent and the quadrivalent, both of them are inactivated or trivalent is a live vaccine and quadrivalent is an inactivated one. So quadrivalent is inactivated for sure. Uh, the the uh, trivalent is also inactivated vaccine and um, that is why it, it uh, provokes a host immunity um, and by passive immunity. So, okay, but then what should be the reason that uh, trivalent gives you more immune response as compared to quadrivalent, number one. And if in all sense quadrivalent is, going, is, is more effective than trivalent, why do you have a trivalent vaccine in the first place? Why not only quadrivalent? Yeah, the trivalent vaccine is uh, specially useful for for uh, patients over 65. So these are the non-pregnant patient groups. So the trivalent vaccine, because the seasonal influenza is limited to only one of the strains in, in over 65, especially in the UK, we will use the trivalent vaccine. Okay. 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 But in, in pregnant women and, and men and women non-pregnant under the age of 65, we'd use the quadrivalent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sir. I think um, uh, all the yeah vaccine advisable in uh, zero positive or HIV positive women. Uh, do you want to comment on that? There's one. Um, I, just yeah, I don't have much uh, information on that, uh, but I would like to hear from other speakers or experts what their experience is with HIV positive uh, uh, patient population groups. Obviously. 
in HIV, the, re the scientific reasoning would be that HIV uh, compromised individuals are already suffering an immune def deficient state. And in order to minimize systemic complications, you're probably best using the influenza vaccine. That would be what the common logic would dictate. What is your, uh, what is your schedule for giving uh, influenza vaccine during pregnancy in UK? Right. So uh, there is this difference. In, in FOXI, the recommendation is from 26 weeks onwards. And I think because of compliance and less visits, especially in semi-rural and semi-urban areas, you try to combine it with uh, another vaccine in the same visit. In the UK, it's given at any stage in pregnancy. Both the pertussis and the influenza is given at, uh, at any stage in pregnancy. But I just saw the FOXI guideline, which says 26 weeks onwards. And maybe there is a reason, uh, like you heard the previous speaker say, that it, it protects even in the preterm delivery. So, for example, if somebody is having the vaccination 26 weeks and delivers preterm at 32 weeks, they will still be transplacental tra transfer and protection of the baby till at least the first immunization at six months. So, I guess it makes sense to be doing it at 26 weeks. Thank you, sir. Any, any further questions are there? No, that's, it. that's all. That's all. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ditta. Um, excellent, excellent presentation and uh, a good overview of the subject that we have. Uh, I think again brings um, two points that have been brought back to the fore by both the speakers is that we need to have influenza vaccine during pregnancy to be routinely administered. Similarly, TDAP vaccine also should be given. Both these vaccines must be given to our pregnant women. Uh, and this is a, uh, uh, the advice that has to be given to all, all of the uh, pregnant women. And this must be followed by all our colleague obstetricians. Thank you, Dr. Dattna, Datta. Thank you so much. Ashley, can you introduce the next speaker? Yes. Mandar, can you change the slide? Yeah. We have with us Brigadier Aruna Menon, madam, to speak on the next topic, that is rubella. She's done her MBBS from Calicut, and she's an alumni of AFMC Pune, and she is right now the HOD of AFMC Medical College. She's been a faculty at several state and national level conferences, and she takes quite interest in writing poetry on women empowerment issues for various journals. Over to you, madam. Aruna, madam, can you start sharing your screen? Uh, Madam, Dr. Menon, are you? Aruna, Madam, can you hear us? You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. can see the screen, Madam. Yeah, and before Ashwini, before we start this um, this lecture, a small point which I just realized, both the speakers that we have after this, that is uh, Dr. Aruna Manan, Madam, and Dr. Girijawad, are both are Trupta Umranikar awardees. Actually, both of them have secured this award in their uh, different years. Uh, so congratulations again once, and it's nice to see uh, uh, both the alumni speaking. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, madam. Yeah. So, first of all, I bring greetings from uh, AFMC and a huge thanks to uh, the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak today at this webinar. And I've been uh, very impressed by the previous two speakers. I hope I can live up to the way they have covered their topics. So, I've been asked to speak on uh, rubella today. As we all know, uh, as obstetricians, uh, rubella is a very important topic, but uh, I, even I needed to kind of brush up what I know about rubella. Uh, so uh, to introduce the topic, it was first described in 1941 by Norman Alistair Gregg, who was an Australian ophthalmologist. He discovered that uh, there was a, a 
a kind of clustering of uh, patients with um, congenital cataract. And when he went into the history, he realized that all of them had mothers who had been infected with rubella. And that is how it was discovered that uh, rubella has a teratogenic potential, accounting for even fetal death, abortions, or what we now know today as congenital rubella syndrome. So though the incidence is significantly reduced, it hasn't yet disappeared. And it is definitely still an endemic problem for us in uh, developing countries, as well as in India. And so it becomes a very uh, important topic for us to discuss. Coming to the virus itself, it, is a, it belongs to the Toga viridae family. It is an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. And uh, the structure, it has two glycoproteins that is, uh, which are important, the E1, which actually determines its antigenic properties and therefore becomes more important when we talk about its vaccines and uh, whatever we, how we diagnose it or how we uh, develop antibodies to it, and E2. It has a single serotype, and though there are several genotypes uh, globally, uh, it is usually, uh, it is a single serotype that circulates all over in the world. Coming to its epidemiology, as we all know, uh, the vaccination era or uh, earlier, before the vaccine rubella was discovered, or in countries where there is no vaccination program as such in place, it is mainly during spring. But sporadic uh, events do occur during other uh, times of the year as well. Humans are the only known reservoir, and that actually limits our uh, method of studying or finding out the pathogenicity of the virus because no animal models can be developed. The transmission, as we know today, is by direct contact, mainly by aerosol through the respiratory system, from where it moves through the systemic circulation into the lymph nodes. And that is why we have the uh, pathognomic uh, lymph adenopathy in rubella, mainly the post auricular lymph node, which is enlarged. The infectious period is around eight years, eight days before the rash appears and eight days after the rash appears. And it is highly infectious. The incidence in the pre-vaccine area is, was mainly among five to nine year olds. And uh, if we look at countries where it has been eliminated, WHO uh, defines elimination as absence of endemic transmission of the virus for a period of 12 months. So the U.S. started its um, uh, vaccination program in uh, 1969, and it, it was so successful that of the cases that were, that they did a zero uh, surveillance and found out that 81% of the cases that were seen in U.S. in 99 were imported from other countries, mainly from Mexico. Now, uh, they do a very strict surveillance program, and in that program, they found that there were just 79 cases of rubella in the period from 2005 to 2012, of which uh, around six were uh, known to cause CRS or congenital rubella syndrome. Now, this, they could not find the known, I mean, the sources as such, but it was definitely not from US born mothers. Europe is also. Uh, aiming at elimination and most of the countries like England and France have succeeded in this uh, the definition of elim elimination by WHO but even so there are cases which occur and there are even outbreaks which occur but they're mainly in Poland and Romania these are however just clinically confirmed and not really lab confirmed now we come to uh, developing countries and our own India. So we have a peculiar situation because the susceptibility is low because of the natural immunity that we develop because most of the younger girls are uh, exposed to this uh, virus. But the, the, there is a very high risk of infection because since the vaccination program is not as robust or successful in India, the young mothers are still exposed to the younger children the girls and even the boys who are carrying this infection. So though there are surveillance programs in place put in by WHO, especially after its program where it wanted to eliminate the virus, our uh, 
year by which we are supposed to eliminate is 2020. So we are in the last phase. And with this aim in mind, MR vaccination program or a combination of uh, vaccination against the measles as well as rubella was put in place in 2017. And the initial part of the program was supposed to be an intense campaign where they would teach the entire population and make them aware and vaccinate them. And then gradually it would be the measles vaccine, which is now there in the UIP or the universal uh, immunization program, would be replaced by the MR vaccine. So that is uh, our target. So though we are still in the last year of the target, so we have not yet got the results of the program, but the program is very much in place. Now, as uh, I've already explained, vaccination forms the cornerstone of elimination. So this was in, introduced in 1969, and the commonly used strain was a live attenuated virus, that is the uh, 27 by 3 strain. And uh, different countries have followed different strategies and schedules. There were initially, it was only the young girls who were immunized and uh, they were the ones who were targeted. Uh, then it was only, then there were some uh, countries started only the immunization of the children between nine and uh, nine months and two years. Then they realized that if you target only the girls, the boys who are getting infected are also there in the normal population. So that was not enough. It was not, I mean, it was considered or it was discovered that just immunizing the girls would not be enough. So since, uh, and it is a very well tolerated, good response uh, uh, inducing vaccine. And so now the current recommendation is that it should be given to all children uh, preferably two doses because even one dose actually causes about 95% of immune response and um, uh, if you give them two doses that is one at nine months between nine to 12 months and the second one before 24 months then the coverage is much more and the response is much more but they say that if you target only the young children or this particular group it takes up to 30 years to uh, actually eliminate the virus. So there are various uh, uh, algorithms and mathematical, uh, uh, what do I say, mathematical predictions. So uh, the current uh, recommendation is that it is not only the young children that should be part of the UIP or the Universal Immunization Program, but the young girls as well as uh, young mothers in the prenatal phase or preconception phase should also be targeted. There is a theoretical risk of uh, problem during pregnancy because it is a live vaccine, but there are several studies which has shown where inadvertent use of the vaccine was made during pregnancy, but did not develop any CRS. So that is possibly because the uh, antigen, I mean, the, uh, the antigen load was not strong enough to create this kind of a problem in the fetus. So the single most important goal of rubella vaccination remains prevention of congenital rubella syndrome because uh, it is the disease as such is a very mild uh, problem which doesn't really have too many uh, after effects or uh, residual effects. So the whole intention of uh, elimination of uh, rubella in the world is to prevent CRS or congenital rubella syndrome. Now, as I said, it depends on the strategy. Either you target only the young girls or only the children or the boys and girls, as well as young adults who are susceptible to rubella. Now, uh, global uh, measles and rubella strategic plan of 2012, which was held in uh, Singapore, now plans at eliminating uh, rubella in five WHO regions, which includes India. A brief recap of what rubella is. It is, uh, as far as the signs and symptoms go, more than 50% of the patients are asymptomatic. Otherwise, it's like any other flu uh, which, with fever, malaise, uh, and the typical rash, which is maculopapular, and it lasts for about two days, um, one to three days. In India, it's not very easy to detect, but uh, the post-auricular lymphadenopathy is a pathognomic sign. So if that is there, then definitely you can think of rubella. So the clinical diagnosis remains a little unreliable. 
some of the young girls can develop polyarthritis and polyarthralgia, especially in the post-pubertal time. And other rare uh, occurrences are post-infection encephalitis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. And uh, a point to note here is that rubella reinfection, though very, very rare, can occur. But it has been found in several studies that this reinfection that occurs is not strong enough to cause any uh, problems of CRS. So then how do we diagnose the disease? Uh, it depends entirely on antibody kinetics. So it is important to know that uh, the IgM, which appears in about three days after infection, but it disappears within four to 12 weeks. So the cornerstone of past infection depend, is on RV IgG, which starts after about eight days and they persist for life. Now this is a uh, algorithm which has been formed for uh, treating or uh, testing antenatal patients whom, in whom you suspect that they may be having rubella. So as soon as possible, within 12 days, you have to look for uh, uh, rubella IgG. If it is detected, that means either the patient was immune earlier and she is, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. If there is no IgG detected, that means the woman is susceptible. Because as I said earlier, the clinical diagnosis is never confirmed. I mean, it's not confirmatory. So you are only suspecting. So this is the only way you can find out whether the mother is at risk or not. So you do a second test after three weeks. If it shows uh, IgM as well as uh, IgG, that means primary infection is uh, is probable. And so you, you have to, you can confirm it by RVIgG again after uh, repeating the sample after 10 days and you have a diagnosis that she was exposed to rubella in that particular period. Uh, if the um, IgM is positive as well as IgG, then a primary infection is possible, but it is not uh, confirmed. And if only IgG is present and there's no IgM, then it is possibly just a non-specific stimulation of the immune system. And if both are negative, then there has been no infection. Now, again, in all these cases, you have to repeat an IgG after 10 days. And if there is a rise or uh, the avidity is more, then uh, if it is more than 10 IU per um, ml, then you have to take it as a, a probable infection during that index. Uh, pregnancy. So in, in which case you have to discuss the possibility of termination with the parents or the mother and you can or you can wait for a confirmation by doing an RT-PCR of the amniotic fluid. Now, uh, As far as congenital rubella syndrome itself is concerned, the pathogenesis is multifactorial. It is assumed that necrosis occurs in the chorion itself and the endothelial cells in very early pregnancy and these are carried to fetal organs like the eyes, heart, and brain. Now, the risk of congenital infection depends on the gestational age at which the infection occurs. Now, if it occurs before 12 weeks of gestation, more than 90% of the uh, fetuses are likely to be infected. The, uh, the infectivity drops to almost 30%, that is only 30% of transfer and infection can occur between 24 to 26 weeks. And after 36 weeks, however, it increases to a complete 100%. So, as we all know, the classic triad of cataract, cardiac anomalies, and sensory neural deafness is what happens in rubella. So, uh, if you take this figure, uh, you can't, the RU stands for can't see rubies, bell stands for can't hear bells, and the a can be converted into a heart, which reminds you that there are heart defects. Now, the transient defects are low birth weight. They may be purpura, they may be anemia, and they may be hepatosplenomegaly in the newborn. Permanent, again, we have ophthalmic problems, auditory problems, as well as CVS and CNS abnormalities. Deafness is the most common defect, and sometimes it may be the only defect, and it should alert you to the possibility that it was a CRS that was uh, present in the baby. Now, late onset, there are some endocrine abnormalities as well as thyroid disorders, diabetes, autoimmune diseases have been described in patients who have had CRS. So the 
if you have a suspicion in the maternal um, uh, in the mother then you have to do a rv igm in the fetal blood amniotic fluid or maybe a chorionic villus biopsy postnatal of course you have to do a rv igm confirm it by rt pcr if it is positive this can be done from either the nasopharyngeal swabs oral fluids or uh, in urine the most commonly used uh, subject is oral fluids in the newborn so what do you do in a pregnant woman again it depends on the gestational age if you are suspecting that she has been exposed to before 18 weeks then the fetus is at very high risk of severe affliction and you need to do a viral rna in the amniotic fluid followed by a detailed usc now again if this has been if the patient has been exposed before 12 weeks then definitely you have to discuss termination of pregnancy and usually a detailed usg will reveal a cataract in the fetus now after 18 weeks you you again counsel the parents and the baby i mean and the pregnancy could be continued with a specific pediatric consult postnatally and uh, you can just follow it up with uh, detailed usg monitoring through the pregnancy so what are our points of interest as obstetricians we know that elimination has not yet been achieved worldwide and definitely not in our country so and as there are no animal models as i said only a human reservoir exists so elucidation of the pathology is also difficult so so we come to a very high importance of doing a prenatal diagnosis and despite all the progress that has happened in the past 25 years cases are being detected even today especially in developing countries so then what is the way out it is the cornerstone of prevention remains the vaccination and hence vaccination and knowledge about the Hello? vaccination also ah uh, shanti na ungalku 10 minutes la call pandra wait panunga please mandar please mute the other participant yeah okay so now we come to the indian story so as i said it has been identified as a by the who as an area to achieve elimination of rubella by 2020 and hence the mass vaccination campaign was launched in 2017 it was actually in february 2017 which targets children from 9 months to 12 years regardless of whether they were vaccinated earlier or not so that there is a mass vaccination program the awareness campaign is also scheduled and then gradually it will be the measles vaccine which exists in the uip would have been replaced by the mr vaccine or the measles rubella vaccine so as i said the uh, definition of elimination is an absence of endemic rubella transmission in a defined area for more than uh, 12 months in the presence of a very well performing surveillance system so again that forms the cornerstone besides vaccination you have to have a good surveillance system in place which will tell you whether your vaccination program is working and whether you're still getting these cases or not so the high coverage of uh, the uh, community with more than 95% of the population having immune is what is our aim uh, coverage by mr vaccine and then we should have lab supported case based surveillance of rubella as well as measles and sentinel site crs surveillance system there are five sentinel sites which have been um, uh, identified in india which includes goa puducherry and uh, delhi and the rest of the uh, obstetricians themselves can put in their bit to find out where what kind of surveillance what kind of uh, zero prevalence of immunity exists so the guidelines are in place to change over from measles to mr and i think most of our uh, pediatricians are now recommending that so that the children are well immunized against rubella we also have to ensure storage and supply of the vaccine in proper dosage and formulation which sometimes forms a problem in india now a brief review of what happened in us after they put in their elimination program in 2004 a cdc panel reviewed and verified that the rubella uh, infection has been eliminated in us from 2005 
to 11. There were only an average of around 11 cases per year. And they considered an, uh, a, a cluster of three cases of CRS as an outbreak. But they, the mothers were followed up and it was found that none of them were US-based. The mothers were all from countries where vaccinations were not in place. So people with uh, documented vaccination of at least one dose are assumed to have immunity. And uh, if uh, that, that documentation is not present, then MMR or MMRV, which includes the varicella vaccine, is recommended for all individuals more than 12 months to preschool. And two doses are recommended for school aged through grade 12. And adults at high risk, whoever that is college uh, going children, young adults who, are, who congregate in areas or groups. And so the vaccination program is definitely going on in very uh, uh, firm uh, methods. And so is the surveillance program. Now, uh, as far as India is concerned, FOGSI had um, propagated in, uh, I think, 2018 in their consensus uh, preconception care, where they recommended that all women in the preconception period should be screened for rubella for immunity and vaccinated if they are not immune. In fact, they went on to say that serological testing is not mandatory. If they say, if they, or they don't know whether they have been vaccinated, then it is best that they receive the vaccine in the preconception period. And MMR is preferred because of the multivalent protection that it uh, affords. Now, since it is a live vaccine, FOXI also exercises caution. And so, according to their guidelines, you are, I um, mean, the patient is advised not to become pregnant for three months. However, as I said earlier, there are several studies which exist that if there is an inadvertent vaccination, they don't seem to be affected with CRS. And so MTP is not indicated or advised. Just a routine, I mean, just a proper USG uh, detailed scanning and a proper um, pediatric consultation specifically with attention to the uh, rubella is, consi is considered adequate after delivery. So despite the ongoing MR program and the intense uh, program that has been in campaigning that is being done, we have recorded 1,263 cases of rubella in the period from May 2018 to April 2019. So we are still a little way off from the actual elimination that may need to be done. So as obstetricians and uh, gynecologists, what would be our role? I uh, would recommend that we check the seroprevalence in our own uh, areas. Like in Pune, we could carry out a study, see, uh, uh, check the young girls or the preconception mothers for a susceptibility that, uh, of the population that we are dealing with. And then do a prenatal as well as an antenatal screening for rubella immunity. And anyone who is not immune should be immunized either preconceptionally or uh, in the postpartum period. So this will actively contribute to the goal of elimination or eradication of rubella and congenital rubella syndrome in our country. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, madam. It was a very, very concise talk. Chaitanya, you can yeah. take the questions if there are any questions. Yeah. Uh, I think the first question she has already answered. What is the management of pregnancy if the patient receives vaccination in the first trimester? So, she, Madam, you have already said that no need to terminate the pregnancy. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, is very correct. There is no. There are several studies where women who have been inadvertently administered the vaccination have been followed up, and they have been found not to develop CRS. Possibly the antigen load. I mean, the viral load is not enough to create that kind of a problem. So definitely MTP is not indicated. Okay. And what would be uh, the period of monitoring of these patients if they have been inadvertently vaccinated and they decide to continue the pregnancy? Any different precautions that we need to take or the monitoring would change in these pregnant patients? Yeah, there is an intense monitoring which is supposed to be done and detailed USD. Again, looking for all the uh, stigmata of CRS and if obviously if any of them do occur then you can offer them termination and postnatally 
treatment, they should have a specific uh, pediatric consult with reference to these uh, problems that uh, may have occurred. Madam, case. when we say a detailed ultrasound, should it be at the time when we are doing the NT scan or should it be at an earlier date? It must be at, uh, the, at a later date around because the uh, cataract and the CVS abnormalities that can be picked up will be only at a later date. Even if you can find them earlier, then it's a different matter. But uh, CVS abnormalities are one of the main problems in CRS. That can be picked up only at a later date. There's another question which asks, uh, uh, antibodies for rubella, for how long they stay? Antibodies for rubella is lifelong. If whether it is by natural immunity or by vaccination, it is lifelong. And I, as I mentioned briefly, there are cases where there have been a reinfection, but those cases are very mild and they definitely do not cause CRS either. The next question is quite an uh, interesting one and many of us face this issue when patients are coming to us from some other doctor, uh, especially yeah. uh, the general practitioners. Kindly elaborate on the IgM, IgG torch test positivity during pregnancy and its management. Yeah, and I, mean, I definitely belong to the category, the school of thought that torch should not be done at all. Unless it is in that index case where you want to look for the particular antibody which you have caused I do not get torch done. If so anybody all has all any... of us are agreeing on this that torch test should not be done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chaitanya, what about what about the times when some patient has already done a uh, rubella torch test? test? Not torch. They have just okay. specifically done say rubella IgG or IgM in the first trimester as a part of their antenatal screening program. And they come, they get referred to you. Then, then how would you deal this scenario? Because there if are many have like IgG, IgM then... which are negative and IgG which are positive. So what do we do in those cases? Most of them are IgG positives, IgM are negative. Yeah. So if your IgM is negative and IgG is positive, obviously it is a previous infection. This particular pregnancy will not be affected. I showed you that algorithm. Even yeah. when we are screening in patients whom you have a suspicion that they may have had. Uh, or they are exposed to rubella, then, uh, I mean, if the IgM is negative, you do not take it as uh, recent infection. So if IgM is positive, will it call it quantify for a, qualify for a uh, termination? Termination. Of yeah? Yes. Yes. It is definitely, is you, can, you can confirm it by doing a IgG uh, with four weeks apart and see if the, uh, you know, I mean, if the levels increase, that again is pathognomic and in that case, yes, I would definitely uh, advise. Or if the patient is not willing, then you can do a uh, amniocentesis or look for the uh, viral RNA in the amniotic fluid itself. Or if you're doing, if it's at the time when you can do a CVS, you could even do that. But then, if a patient, that means if a patient comes to us with IgG positivity, we should be recommending her to do the test again after four weeks. Not IgG. Yeah. But if, IgM positive. if it is only IgG. Okay, because that will show that it is a recent infection. Uh, uh, another question is that the dose of vaccine, is it the same when we are doing, uh, giving it in the school uh, and in the preconception period? Yeah, yeah. that is 0.5 ml subcutaneous. It is the same. Okay. That's it. There has been a few recommendations that the simple vaccine and pregnancy is sufficient. Kindly comment. I didn't get that question. Can you please repeat it? The rubella vaccine is given a month prior. We said that after giving vaccination, we should ask them to not get pregnant for three months. Yeah. The so there are recommendations which say that... For one month. Yeah. So what is yeah. your comment on See, even for three months or one month, the... Um, the final recommendation is the same because there have been studies where 30 to 35 uh, patients who have been inadvertently vaccinated during the first trimester have been followed up and there was no evidence of CRS in these patients. So you do not advise MTP, other, you can only do a detailed uh, UST. Okay. And a false. Once the patient comes, one question, one question uh, okay, sir, go ahead. No. No, I was just following with that same IgM which is positive in early pregnancy. Now yeah. she 
you you decide for termination patient gets the termination done now in such yeah. a patient for how long will you wait for her to go in for the next pregnancy would you just keep on serially monitoring her every few 3 months or 6 months or whatever so how are you it is like uh, giving her a vaccine her natural immunity will start within 3 to 4 weeks after the exposure and then she's immune for life so she is not going to have any problem in the next pregnancy as long as she waits for a maybe one month and before that anyway she is not going to get pregnant so to be on the safer side maybe you could advise three months yeah but nothing more than but then you don't want to monitor her igm um, igm levels uh, whether she is positive or not because igm she... levels definitely not so, igg you could do because if anything more than 10 iu per ml uh, of igg is indicative that she is immune once she is immune she is not going to transmit anything to the uh, fetus as far as rubella is concerned so whether it's natural immunity or your vaccinated immunity she is immune for life okay thank you madam okay. one question but i think we will answer that at the end because we i want uh, opinions from all of you regard this is regarding mmr and covid 19 so let's take okay. it at the end after we finish with madam stock girija madam stock. okay fine thank you yeah thank you madam thank you madam ashwini yes can you introduce the yeah now we move on to the next talk by dr girija madam on fever in pregnancy i think girija madam needs no yeah, introduction please. she is also a vice president here yes madam in a minute first I'll... my power will go off my talk will get interrupted okay. enough <laughs> okay we'll directly yeah, start please <laughs> yeah because I... Over to you, ma'am. Yes, yes. Good. Yeah, please share your presentation. Okay, so I am going to really speak very fast because I have some power challenges here. So fever with pregnancy is the task that has been given to me by my own society, and thank you so much, Harshad and Ashwini, for giving me this opportunity. We all know that acute or chronic infectious diseases may be contracted during pregnancy and conception, and there can be a coexisting disease in the mother already. And the concern is whether this is going to get transmitted to the baby, intrapartum, antepartum, or postnatal. And infectious illnesses and fevers in the mother therefore must be treated as serious illnesses. The issue, however, is that I am not going to deal much with the postpartum uh, thing because there are a lot of things related to sepsis that are to be considered. We are going to speak only about antenatal issues. So when you look at an abnormally high blood uh, temperature at least thirty-eight point three point six, and this is something that we have to really note today in the face of the COVID pandemic. fever due to viral or bacterial or even any kind of hyperthermia during pregnancy has been identified not to be very safe for various reasons what we are going to talk about is the acute febrile illnesses and the fevers that we have during pregnancy and we all know that you are going to be looking at the respiratory urinary tract or gastrointestinal infections or sometimes you may have acute undifferentiated febrile illnesses and whenever you have localized infections we have to consider whether it's an urinary tract infection bronchitis or even tooth abscesses i have had a maternal mortality occurring with a tooth abscess where a patient walked into bharti hospital and she simply succumbed in 6 hours of admission you can have acute undifferentiated febrile illnesses and one of them can be malaria and especially looking at the endemicity in our country we have to be well aware of treating malaria in pregnancy and always having a strong suspicion there are infections such as dengue and chikungunya which are also known to affect the mother and at this point in time when we look at the epidemiology we feel that dengue is much more in rise in pregnant mothers than would be malaria we had a wonderful talk on influenza but influenza also in the 2007 pandemic and later on in 2012 did tell us that pregnant moms are much much at risk of developing ARDS secondary to influenza then of course we have to think of the bacteremias the e coli especially the urinogenital um, infections are usually e coli and staph aureus many a times what we see in our practices is an acquired infection because of hospital bound contamination and then of course the uh, influenza we talked about and infections such as leptospirosis can really take your googly because 
we had a late onset HELLP once and it actually was leptospirosis. Of course, this was a nomadic patient who was not a uh, dweller of uh, the state of Maharashtra. So whenever we have a fever of more than 38.3 degrees, and if you look at the TLC, and that has to be a practice looking at the complete blood count, especially I want to draw your attention to the fact of neutropenia, we have to consider why is it so. One of the important confounding things that can come to our mind is it can be because it's a pregnant mother, she may have an abnormal immune response. And that is something that we have to remember. And we have to look at these patients, categorize them as low risk and high risk. And depending on the level of neutropenia, you have to decide whether they require any hospitalization. And I must tell you guys that the electricity has come. So can, I can reduce my speed and I can be there in the part of the discussion. Thank you so much for being so patient with me. So, and then depending on this, we have to take a call about what is, uh, how are we going to treat the patient. Another very important thing is about leukocytes. We are in the habit of looking at only at the hemoglobin level. It's a good practice to look at lymphocytosis, eosinophils, and also at leukocytosis. Any TLC at any time during the pregnancy of more than 12,000 requires attention. It is not because of the pregnancy inflammatory change. An inflammatory and infection are going to be a little different and I'm going to come to that a little shortly. So whenever we look at the algorithm for initial management of common febrile infection, this holds to pregnant men. We'll be definitely asking them to say that is fever urinary frequency abnormalities. Now, if the answer is in COVID-19 infections now, I guess with the pandemic being there with us for the past six months, if the answers to this question are no, then think of fever with retro muscle pain could be leptospirosis, fever headache and dry cough can be malaria, or fever with nausea, vomiting, malaise can be viral hepatitis. It's always a good practice to do the total cell counts, the differential counts, ESR, urine analysis, malaria test, and look at the liver function test, especially the LT levels, because that's really going to tell us whether there is going to be any hepatic affliction. Now, normal or low T uh, uh, total counts would try to uh, look towards dengue. And it's always good practice to look at the antigens or the antibodies only after 72 hours of the fever, because if you do it too early, you may miss the diagnosis. High T uh, total count, high ESR, abnormal urine, can be because of leptospirosis and hepatorenal meningitis bleeding can be affected. So sometimes if you have patients of HELLP or eclampsia, you may have an infective cause which you have to be keeping in the back of your mind. Today we have uh, access to the rapid malaria test and if it comes positive, natural evaluations that are specific towards that particular causative disease have to be performed after 48 to 72 hours. And if you have alterations in the liver enzymes, then actually it will be viral hepatitis. But out of this, if you ask me, HBE is the worst. And therefore, sometimes in a pregnant woman, you would have to go ahead and do the viral markers to identify this. Now, what is very important is we have to be looking at hypotension, hypoxia, dehydration, tachycardia, tachypnea, altered sensorium, severe malice, dehydration, and poor performance. All this was always then in our medical literature and in our antidepressant care. But unfortunately, we were not paying much heed to it probably. And now, with the advent of the pandemic, we have now become aware and we have to look at this very, very carefully, especially in pregnant mothers. <coughs> now, the commonest infection which can cause fever with chills or febrile illness in pregnancy is usually the urinary tract infection. And out of this, asymptomatic bacteria is a terminology which has now hold its seed, held its seed only in context of pregnancy. If you took, talk to your physician friends, they will say such a terminology does not exist anymore. Only in the context of pregnancy it remains because when we have been sitting across in our hospitals writing our antibiotic policies, every time we have had the physicians and the microbiologists on board who have said that this particular entity has to be cornered only for antenatal or pregnancy-related mothers. But this is our bound duty.
to screen our mothers for asymptomatic baciduria. And usually the recommendation of the ACOG is that to do it around 16 to 18 weeks of gestation. So you just take, take the midstream urine and send it for urine culture sensitivity. If that's not possible, even on microscopy, if you have an access through your lab to look at the leukocyte yeast rays, it can tell you that this woman has urinary tract infection, which requires to be corrected. Because many women have the susceptibility of going into ascending urinary infection, which is pyelonephritis, can be extremely devastating and not only devastating, it can land the woman into an acute or a chronic renal failure. Acute urethritis or cystitis are very, very symptomatic and they would be associated with dysuria, frequency of micturition and feeling constantly a need of urination and this has to be asked for in the patient correctly. And as I mentioned that women are at a very high risk of developing pyelonephritis, symptoms of acute cystitis plus flank pain is very, very typical. They would have a very high grade fever and this could lead to preterm labor, severe infection, and adult respiratory distress syndrome. I can never forget one of my patients who was admitted with acute pyelonephritis and required an ICU care of actually 21 days, after which she had to be put on dialysis for a while. And of course, now she currently she's doing well after nearly one year. Now, preventing the urinary tract infection is extremely important. So one of the pregnancy cares in our patient has to be not only screening for urinary tract infection, but also speaking about perineal hygiene and genital urinary hygiene, because infections such as bacterial vaginosis have been known to be associated with such kind of a malady. So when you are managing a urinary tract infection during pregnancy, starting an oral therapy with an empirically chosen antibiotic that is effective against gram-negative aerobic coliform bacteria is the first choice usually because that's the commonest bacteria that we get during the antenatal period. And we all know that cephalosporins, especially the cephalexin, erythromycin, nitrofurantine are quite safe during the entire pregnancy, barring the fact that nitrofurantine is usually not recommended in the later part of the second trimester and the third trimester causing being responsible sometimes for hemolysis. Then of course, amoxicillin, clavulonic acid combination can be used, but it may not be safe for the baby. So immediately around the perinatal period would not be used correctly. And then the trimethoprim sulfamethazole would usually be placed in the middle that is during the... Hello, Girija Going to cause some sort of a cartilaginous deformities in the newborn, and therefore they are contraindicated. So when we look at the treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, you have your urine preg um, uh, culture sensitivity coming positive, or acute cystitis in pregnancy. Your first go-to medicine can be the nitrofurantoin. Amoxicillin, of course, will cause a lot of diarrhea and co. Um, Combination, as I mentioned, cephalexin, phoscomycin is a new uh, sort of um, uh, microbial medication given in the form of three gram dose once at the night time. And this has to be warned to the patient that she may experience a little loose motions or gases when she's taking that. So these are the various ways, but once you have found it to be positive, never forget to again look at doing a urine culture sensitivity after six weeks or two months to confirm that she's not getting a recurrence of this particular ASB. Even if a rarity, it definitely can cause serious consequences. Now, if you have a patient who is having fever, motion of the microbiological culture, cultures, then you have to look at various places. Is she having an upper thorax infection? Does she have any abdominal infection? Or does she have any vascular infections? And all these have to be done with a proper clinical uh, examination. Many times, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, hepatic tenderness are something which are missed by obstetricians, and that's something it's that we have to look hours. at. So we have to also consider if the patient has any underlying pathology, incidences like infectuca endocarditis, myocarditis can be there. They can be in a patient of asthma, they can be ARGS or bronchitis, 
There can be cholecystitis. We have landed up in doing sometimes cholecystectomy because that can give rise to pancreatitis and that can be presenting as a fever illnesses. And sometimes if the patient has had been using any catheter, then catheter-related sepsis. So any kind of fever that you would investigate in a non-pregnant woman would also be seen in a pregnancy-related patient. Now, sometimes patients would have recurrent febrile attacks. It would not be when you measure, she tells you that she is coming with a temperature. And these are the patients which we have to look at because they could be having some sort of an infectious pathology or an autoimmune disease or a malignancy. So do not ignore fevers when the patients are presenting to you with fever and always get into the habit of last, asking for family history because something like SLEs and uh, rheumatoid arthritis can also present with fever during pregnancy. Now, whenever we are evaluating long-term febrile illnesses in pregnancy, one of the easiest way of diagnosing any upper respiratory tract infections or problems is by doing an X-ray chest. And as clinicians and obstetricians, we must be well aware of what are the various dosages that are going to be delivered. Now, especially in the COVID pandemic, this knowledge is essential because the radiologist would ask us as obstetricians, can I take an X-ray in our patient and we should be able to give them an answer. And you can understand that two X-ray views do not really cause any harm to the mother. And currently we are doing MRI of the X-ray and that also should not be harmful. You can go ahead and evaluate the patient by doing an ultrasound of the lungs and that can also give you an insight. So this is a dosing which can be kept as a ready reckoner or a reference for you, wherein you can guide your patients about the X-radiation. Now, sometimes you may have fever, which is associated with pruritus or a rash. And then if there is pruritus, ask the question, answer is yes. Uh, ask whether there is exacerbation of the existing skin lesions such as eczema or contact dermatitis. Pregnancy specific ones can be cholestasis of pregnancy, polymorphous eruption of pregnancy and pemphicoid gestineosis and this can be a result of an idiosyncratic response to certain medications. So you must look at them carefully and believe me that even obstetric jaundice, the ICP occurs even in the earlier part of gestation. It's not always that it will occur at um, There have been reports when at even at 24 weeks, ICP has been reported. And of course, you have to look for infections such as scabies. Of course, there'll be no fever associated. Now, if the rash is maculopapular, then we had a talk on rubella, consider that parvovirus B19 is something which is found to be a little more prevalent in that area where sickle cell disease is present. But it can be present anywhere. And unfortunately, we really do not know the epidemiology in our country. But this is a virus which is known to really affect the babies, the neonates, really adversely. Measles, HIV, and Zika can also present with fever, meningococcal, streptococcal infections, CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, enteroviruses, and syphilis can be associated with rash. Now, they can also be varicella, and that is something which is extremely uh, troublesome, and this can definitely be prevented by offering a woman preconceptional, of course, you have to have an opportunity of giving a preconceptional uh, varicella injection because if a woman suffers from varicella during pregnancy, it's quite a debilitating disease, doesn't cause any harm to the baby, barring the fact that preterm deliveries and growth restrictions can occur. But then that is, again, depending on the gestational age at which the affection would occur. And then, of course, we have to consider referral to a dermatology if we are not able to specify or classify why this infection is occurring. Now, as I mentioned at the outside, I would want to discuss a few things about inflammation. Whenever we talk of any inflammatory process, we always think that it is infection. Like the COVID has given us an insight, yes, there could be a triggering element, which is actually causing the infection first. But then once it has gone down, done its own work, it may trigger an inflammatory process in the mother. And this is very important. What has been identified as something like a cytokine storm in the COVID-19. Similar kind of a thing can occur with any kind of an infection in a pregnant mother because of a different immunological calculation and formula altogether. And therefore, these mothers have to be kept under close surveillance. So there can be a transplacental or a hematogenous infection. There can be ascending infections from the vagina or the cervix. And there can be iatrogenic infections if you have caused amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. 
and these can give rise to intrauterine infections such as deciduitis, choriamnionitis, funicitis, and pathogen recognition and innate immune response actually do not lead us to anywhere. And there is definitely a maternal inflammatory response uh, associated also with a fetal inflammatory response. And these can give rise to initiation of preterm labor and preterm births. It can also, and this has been attributed even to bacterial vaginosis, it can go into a pro-inflammatory cytokine buildup and production, giving rise to an affection to the babies in the form of cerebral white matter damage, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, giving rise to fetal neonatal consequences. So whenever you have any such kind of a presentation, don't ward it off as a malingering. Probably we are looking at something which is a little more serious and our attention has to go to these things. <clears throat> so therefore, I always uh, want people to look at the TLCs a little more um, diligently. And then, of course, we have to understand the chorioamnionitis, the risk factors, pathogenesis, and clinical findings. And it can be anything like maternal fever. Maybe because of chorioamnionitis, it can be something else which has given rise to this. And many a times, the cause can be bacterial vaginosis, multiple digital examinations after membrane rupture, group E strep positive. But believe me, in the last 15 years of my association with Bharti Vidyapit and the perinatology workup, we have not come across any such kind of pneumonitis. What we find is usually E. coli in the, uh, in the vaginal swabs and the urinary system in these patients and even in the lyca. But what I want to say is whenever we speak to our perinatologists, they say usually the infections that the babies suffer from are acquired in the neonatal ICU. They are not something coming from the genital tract. It's possible that we are not screening in that requisite form because there are very specific kind of tests that require to be performed to identify what actually has caused this particular uh, issue. Since we have decided that we are not going to be speaking about what happens in the perinatal and onward phase, I just want to touch upon the fact that maternal, these women are definitely at risk of sepsis, ARDS, and pyelonephritis, and we therefore have to be careful. Now, this is a very interesting publication from the Indian group, and this is talking about the fetal maternal outcome of pyrexia in pregnancy, and this was a prospective study. And you can see in the uh, left corner of my screen that the reasons why women had this kind of infections, you can see the commonest ones were seen on here. Most of them had pleural effusion, pneumonia, severe anemia, diarrhea, hypoglycemia, convulsions, mild jaundice, deep jaundice, and ARF, with chicken pox being here. And you can see that hepatitis, respiratory tract infections, and typhoids were commonly seen. And then how did they affect the perinatal outcome? And you can see that the reasons found associated were low birth weight babies, preterm babies, growth restriction, less than seven Abgar at birth, perinatal deaths, and therefore, there is a quite a significant total adverse outcome, and especially highest being associated with malaria. And therefore, we have to be looking at these patients definitely a little more cautiously. Additional concern that we have because our patients are now Google queens, and therefore they would ask us questions, doctor, I'm having a febrile illness, how is it going to affect my baby? Because high fever in pregnancy is known to be associated with birth defect with a core body temperature of 39 degrees centigrade, that is 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit, gestational days between 14 to 28, and the central nervous system seems to be the most affected with microcephaly, hypotonia, microphthalmia, anencephaly, occipital encephalocele, meningomyelocele, and spina bifida, especially in the gestational age 25 to 28. Spontaneous abortions also can be associated. And a brief fever episode usually has no association in birth defects or decreased intelligence. And acclimatization is known to reduce the risk of CNS defects. And there is a huge lot of understanding today about autism spectrum disorders, but I have purposefully not added it here. Now let's look at the typical cause in the first trimester of pregnancy and you have to be well versed with treating it with chloroquine is known to be uh, used for uh, plasmodium vivax but for falciparum you may have to require to use a multi-therapy 
it is quinine or it can be artesunate combination therapy which has been now tested and found to be safe in the second and the third trimester or even the sulfadoxin pyrimethamine combination can be given women who are immunocompromised like diabetics or hiv positive women are little more at risk of developing these infections and once they get the plasmodium vivax they have to continue taking chloroquine till the time of delivery they are not to be given primaquin but weekly 300 mg of chloroquine is to be given to them in the first trimester you may consider giving them quinine or you can give them clindamycin or <clears throat> you can uh, uh, act is again not given and in the second and the third trimester you can consider giving them acd or asp or al as anti malarial therapy now varicella case is something that can really cause a challenge and i have had an experience of dealing with about 6 to 8 such patients who have really really terrible symptoms and presentations during the antenatal period it is important that we confirm the diagnosis particularly if the clinical diagnosis is unclear and no known contact history then we may have to take a course of doing immunofluorescence or pcr of the lesion consider differential diagnosis it can be an hsv and if it is found to be uh, rule it out and if the pcr is positive then you have to assess for complications like abs fever pneumonitis hemorrhagic rash secondary bacterial infection and the treatment for that is usually admission to the hospital single negative pressure room contact with human personnel only and the treatment offered is with a cyclovir 10 mg per kg body weight given eight hourly for 7 to 10 days and antibiotics may be considered to prevent superior bacterial infections and we have to initiate the infection and control the risk management and monitor for complications or development of new lesions and while this is happening to the mother you have to keep the baby under surveillance for growth restriction and there is a possibility of preterm delivery if the woman gets acute febrile attacks it's important that the fever is controlled every time during pregnancy when it tries to go beyond 100 or 101 by giving a simple paracetamol and that is found to be safe during pregnancy even if it is in the perinatal period now depending on the gestational age when the varicella occurs between 5 days antepartum to 2 days postpartum there is a possibility of neonatal varicella and there can be a severe form associated varicella more than 5 days before delivery neonatal varicella can be possible and third trimester of pregnancy they can be associated with maternal pneumonia and they can be infantile shingles before 13 weeks of gestation there can be a fetal varicella syndrome and varicella between 13 weeks and 20 weeks fetal varicella syndrome with a mortality of 30% in the first month of life and severe varicella at any stage of pregnancy can give rise to intrauterine demise so maternal varicella before 20 weeks of gestation or cyclovir therapy should be used when benefit of outweighs risk and varicella after 20 weeks oral acyclovir or intravenous acyclovir may be considered depending on the severity of the infection now congenital varicella syndrome there is no treatment is effective has a very high mortality rate and neonatal varicella should be promptly treated with intravenous acyclovir 10 to 15 mg per kg every 8 hours for 5 to 7 days so <clears throat> you have to remember that the effects of i don't know something happened um now in the current situation we have to remember that the pregnant women where we have to segregate every patient walking to our labor room as low risk moderate risk and high risk for covid because most of our centers today are doing screening for all mothers who are coming to the covid labor room they are not only doing screening by doing the symptomatic screening or the thermal screening but also by asking for contact history and by doing the rt pcr or the antibody screen and therefore these we have to be well aware of and if your mother is a moderate risk mother then you have to understand that she has to be not only be treated by you but has to be under the joint care of the physician and the microbiologist or the infection specialist and there has to be a proper monitoring of the fetus we have had an experience of training to control pretend preterm labors in bharti vidyapeet wherein we had mothers who had presented with morbidly aderen placenta at 31 weeks of gestation with threatened preterm labor 
and we successfully tried to temporize her when she was suffering from an active COVID infection by giving magnesium sulfate steroids and then took her on after she resolved that infection later on at around 35 to 36 weeks where we could take her for a caesarean section with a better outcome. So if the admission is necessary, you have to admit, isolate, swab and assess the vitals, use appropriate universal precaution methods, do a continuous monitoring of the baby. Please remember that the mama, mothers are hypoxic, so babies can get compromised and you have to individual the decision of delivery. So this is something that can be done, doable, and there's something that we should not have fear about if you take proper precautions. So what is very important is the cytokine storm, which we have to understand and which has been much recognized in the context of COVID-19. I feel it was always there in pregnant mothers and HELLP and such syndromes are signs of this COVID storm kind of a thing. It can give rise to hypercoagulopathy, maternal hypoxia and placental infection. And if you're really thinking of preventing such kind of an infection, I think of looking at all the evidences that are available today, low dose aspirin, is supposed to be the best prophylactic measure for protecting pregnant moms at this point in time. And of course, the universal precautions that we are talking of, the mask and everything. But low-dose aspirin has been found to be giving a better evidence because the first thing that hits is cytokine storm. So it has an effective anti-inflammatory action and it also has an action against hypercoagulopathy. So that is something that we can definitely consider because of this uncontrolled systemic inflammation that is associated, giving rise to lymphopenia, giving rise to ARDS, multi-organ failure and death. The questions are, how is it going to affect the fetus? Miscarriages, preterm births and fetal distress can occur. The question about vertical transmission is not yet answered, but there has been a higher incidence of IUDs, neonatal asphyxias, pneumonitis and neonatal deaths, chorioamnionitis and PROMs in the infants. So we have to be looking at hyperthermia very, very carefully because it can cause fetal structural and functional defects, especially affecting the central nervous system of the baby. And this is another publication. I don't know whether I've been able to annotate it, which is shown that in association with hyperthermia, and you can see that fever without antipyretics and fever with antipyretics, it was found that there is definitely a better kind of a risk modification if you use antipyretics judiciously and at the right time. So please look at fevers in pregnancy. At least the first line management has to be hydration and giving them antipyretics by the time you're evaluating these mothers and ensuring that they don't go into consequences of hypothermia. This was the publication that I was mentioning just now, which was published by this group, uh, by Anderson et al. from Denmark, which they observed uh, this particular observation. And I must share with you this kind of a baby which was born with us in Bharati Vidya way back, 14 years back. And this is sitting in our anatomy dissection hall. And this had a typical history. This woman, at the time when she missed her periods, had taken ibuprofen because she had bronchitis. Now the question is whether she had bronchitis because of any such viral infection which caused such kind of a defect or was it because of the abnormal combination of the anti-inflammatory medicines which was given to her. So this is an unanswered question. But what we can learn from this is you have to be very, very categorical in using NSAIDs now during the pandemic, but even during pregnancy for any women. Only paracetamol has been identified to be safe and try to avoid any medications as far as possible in the first trimester if they are not essential. So in conclusion, a wide range of maternal medical complications as well as fetal and neonatal complications occur due to pyrexia and pregnancy from various etiologies that range from preventable infections like malaria to hepatitis. And I would always want that we have to take this particular opportunity of preconceptional counseling to protect mothers against varicella, against rubella, against hepatitis. And even if you have missed that bus, you can definitely offer hepatitis during pregnancy safely, and it can be a part of your pregnancy vaccination program. Hence, standard methods of infection control in homes, communities, and healthcare settings should be emphasized. Today, we have become extremely lax and lenient, and we have to be extremely strict about the fact because for me, COVID-19, a, a best vaccination is going to be your mask and hand washing. So that is something that we have to encourage vaccinate against preventable 
uh, diseases such as hepatitis, influenza, varicella, and rubella. And we can do a whole lot of good for our pregnant mothers. Thank you. Thank you, Gerija. Thank you so much, Gerija, madam. It was a power-packed presentation. Madam, a couple of questions. What is the best antibiotic for post-coital utility prophylaxis? Huh? I didn't get that. What UTI prophylaxis. UTI. UTI, UTI prophylaxis. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, if the woman is having recurrent urinary tract infections, then during pregnancy, it is better that she abstains. That is one. Secondly, if she is non-pregnant, then the best one is identified actually till now is norfloxacin or nitrofurantoin. The advantage of nitrofurantoin is that it is not developing so much of resistance as norfloxacin would. And therefore, now for the post-coital uh, kind of cystitis, many of our uh, urologist friends say that it's always a good practice also to take it maybe after every coital act. But in a young woman, that would be difficult. We still have to have some more data coming from the use of phosphomycin. And I think I am one who I'm very, um, you know, very um, commonly using phosphomycin whenever even the first cells, or there's any pyruria scene, waiting for the culture sensitivity type, I would use phosphomycin for this patients because it's a once in a time, once in a month, uh, depending on what are the patient's needs. So post would be in the context, whether it's a young woman, whether it's a, a woman in the reproductive age, or it's a woman who is in a perimenopausal age, and that will determine actually what kind of uh, antimicrobial you would use and the frequency. Thank you, madam. Uh, that's all. One more question that has actually come up is that when would fever in pregnancy become an indication for termination of pregnancy? I don't think that we should go and terminate pregnancy only if she is suffering from any kind of consequences like myocarditis, endocarditis, where it's become life threatening to the mother, then you will have to individualize and decide. There was some discussion which was also going about the rubella vaccine being given inadvertently. Uh, if we can talk about that later, I would like to give my inputs into that. But uh, a high grade of fever would not be an indication, but that would be an indication for surveillance. Because we have to understand that sometimes vertical transmission doesn't happen 100%. There is a possibility of it being 20 to 30%. Similar to, you know, glycosylated hemoglobin 7, they cut the sublog, they terminate karo. Not necessary. You can always put the patient under surveillance. Unfortunately, with certain viral infections like the B19 parvovirus and all, we have no way of finding out whether the baby is affected. Maybe considering now today we can do amniocentesis and then take a call can be the uh, second uh, approach to it. But that is something which is not so easily accessible always. Thank you. Any other question, Ashwini? Any other questions that are come? Are still no, there? I think, sir, these were the questions. One Madam, more you just question. mentioned I in your to talk. Make a point. Huh? One very important yes. point is please do not. Now, today we are on the 11th, and uh, Parag and I are heard on Radio City today. And I want to say that maintain Bara. Please remember that whenever you are doing those CPCs, maybe you are doing it twice, maybe you are doing it thrice, whenever you are doing the complete blood count in your patients. Definitely see that the hemoglobin is maintained at 12 gram percent and her TLC counts are lower than 12,000 and more than 5,000. Even a simple thing will tell you that we have to look at the patient's immune response. You don't have to go in for any great glamorous test. Even that can help in optimizing patient's health. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, madam. I think these were the questions. Madam, you mentioned in your talk that you also give hepatitis. So what is your schedule for hepatitis in pregnancy? Started I as early as? I time the hepatitis either one is around because uh, most of my patients take the first tetanus at around 16 to 18 weeks. And then the hepatitis done around 24 to 26 point, uh, 22 to 24 weeks. And the Tdap is given at the 26 to 28 weeks timeline. Okay. And I give the flu at 12 to 14 weeks. The influenza vaccine. Okay, madam. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think these were all the questions. And if your patients can't afford Tdap, then give them Td. 
Yeah. Actually, the point that now has been driven home by all the four speakers is well, well taken about vaccinations that need to be given timely in pregnancy and a uh, um, lot of now the antenatal care has actually also becoming, becoming more sometimes also opportunistic because we're trying to becoming opportunistic in catching either infections or preventing by giving some vaccines. So all, all these have to be incorporated in the newer schedules of our, our antenatal cares that our obstetricians are going to be giving. Um, I think with this, uh, we should sum up today's program. And I would like uh, Ashwini uh, Chaitanya to uh, do the um, th um, vote of thanks. Thank you, Ashwini, sir. Uh... Thank you so much, all the speakers for today, Dr. Geeta Balsarkar, Dr. Deep Datta, Brigadier Dr. Aruna Menon, and Professor Dr. Girija Wak for the excellent talks and enlightening us on vaccinations and fever in pregnancy. I also like to thank Dr. Harshad Parasnis and Dr. Ashwini Kaya for chairing the session. Uh, I would like to thank the conference for provide, providing us the platform and uh, GSK for their academic grant. Therefore, all in all, uh, it was an excellent session today and uh, see you soon with the next uh, POGS Connect with Experts. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Eta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. Go offline. Okay.